Welcome to OAA Now, your home for Oakland Activities Association news and information. Here's your host, Sammy Taramina. Welcome to OAA Now here. I'm Sammy Taramina, blogger around the OAA, the host of Last Three Brain Cells, and the host of Between Taramina's on Oriented Television. I'd like to welcome those watching on the Look of Voice on SoundCloud and those watching on Oriented Television. A lot to look at this week here, obviously, in the podcast. We're going to break down a lot of things around the league here. We're going to break down the new rule changes from the MHA Representative Council. We're going to also talk girls basketball. Um, new coach at Oxford, um, obviously, you know, um, you know, so there's a lot to break down there. And then also we're going to preview the regional this weekend um, for track and field. So a lot to look at this weekend. So let's look at our main story here. Um, this is going to be the um, changes, the rule changes. Um, you know, there's going to be some changes, obviously, that's been made, um, especially around the um, – you know, with the um, representative council, they've always made some big time decisions in the spring and in this one here, no different. Um, so when you look at the difference here, and I think this is probably going to be the one that I think really is going to stand out the most is the introduction of boys volleyball and um, girls field hockey are going to be official MHA sports starting in 2025 and 2026. Um, for me, I think this is a long time coming because the reason why I say this is because, you know, you look at especially girls field hockey as really starting to take off in popularity. Um, you know, especially when you look at teams like West Bloomfield, who's got a field hockey team. Um, it's an interesting, it's going to be very interesting to see how this sport, um, you know, spreads into the entire OAA. And I think this is going to be something to really, really watch for. Um, is can the, um, you know, I, I, I love the addition of field hockey. Of course, it's going to be played in the fall. Um, and then also boys volleyball. I've started noticing that, you know, volleyball, you know what I mean? It's starting to take off in popularity. It's a club sport. Um, but it's going to be an official sport starting off in 2025, 2026. Um, they're going to be spring. It's going to be a sport played in the spring. Um, you look at some leagues already when you look at, um, you know, you really look at the boys' volleyball divisions. I mean, it contests of 69 teams in 11 divisions. Um, the, a lot of OA schools, um, they have these divisions. Um, the Detroit Area West, it has North Farmington. Farmington are in there, and the Detroit Area North will have um, Lake Orion, Clarkston, Avondale, and Adams um, are in that um division so you know so big news there obviously is the um the addition of of um girls field hockey and also boys volleyball um gonna be made um mha mha official sports um so that is big big news there from the um representative council um other th other other um decisions that were made from the representative council i mean like which were really interesting um Football, the divisions um, are not going to change, um, which is really unfortunate. Um, but, you know, that was the decisions they made. Um, and then you look at the, um, you know, then, of course, you look at, um, obviously, I'm, I'm looking at this here with everything here. I mean, like, beginning in the um, last weekend of February, um, you know, of course, um, the last weekend will include team wrestling, bowling, competitive cheer. Uh, first weekend of March is wrestling, boys hockey, ice hockey, and girls gymnastics. The boys basketball finals will move the second week in March. Um, with the girls basketball finals, will probably conclude the winter season during the third week in March. So those are very interesting um, scenarios that the fact that the MHA is going to go more boys start off the year first and it's going to be the girls. They're starting to move that into a permanent, um, permanent situation there. Uh, basketball seasons are going to be ending earlier. Um, you know, they're going to have 22 games. Uh, basketball practice will able to begin five days earlier on a Wednesday. Keep tryouts and practice from falling during Thanksgiving week. So that's very interesting there. Um, the postseason, obviously, no more. Um, every team's going to get seeded now. Um, when you look at it here, it makes a lot of sense here to seed everybody. And this was something that I've been looking at a couple of years ago with my co-host Ian Locke. Um, you know, when you look at 
the start of the NPR system, um, you know, especially when you look at, at um, soccer and um, basketball. And, and basketball, they, they seat the top two teams and they go by alphabetical on the rest of the seats. So to me, it wasn't right that they did that. Um, but now you look at NPR, now it's going to seed everybody. It's going to tell the matchups. It's going to basically, you know, and I think this is, this is a good decision for them to use it for both, um, both basketballs, um, both girls and boys basketball. Um, it, 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 it was, it should have been done a few years ago. It should have been done when they introduced the system. And the MHA said, finally, okay, you know what I mean? We got to get this fixed. And they finally got this fixed. And, you know, now you look at, um, now I know a lot of basketball people are saying, like, where's the shot clock? Where's the shot clock? You know? But I'm telling you right now, it is a nightmare for a timekeeper if you have to do a shot clock. I mean, you know, you obviously, you know, and I think there's some other things to talk about, too. Um... You know, but I think when you look at the NPR decision to bring them um, to seed everybody, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, like, it also creates some really interesting matchups. Like, just imagine yourself, you're like the two versus three. I mean, like, you know, or the one versus five. I mean, like, you know, I feel like a five team district or a 16 district. I mean, you kind of got to figure it out. Okay. You know, what I mean, it, it basically makes a lot of sense when <laughs> if like a three versus. It basically like if like the um, lower seeds play each other, then that plays the top seed. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how the MHA does this when it comes to seeds. But the MHA made the right decision here to seed everybody. You know, I mean, like if you're like in a, in a district where, you know, you have to deal with Orchard Lake St. Mary's or West Bloomfield, um, hypothetical example, you know, then everybody else is like, you know what I mean? You're basically... <laughs> going to be seated by an alphabetical order. Um, to me, that's not right. I mean, like, but um, but they're going to be seated the way that they are, how they finish, how they perform, um, your schedule, think the schedule. So, MHA got it right here for both basketball and soccer to um, basically seed, um, to seed everybody. And I think that makes sense. Um, of course, we talked the playoff scenarios already. Um, you know, and I think this is going to be interesting to see how, um, you know, we, we talk about this here. I mean, there's no change to playoff format, um, which, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, like, you know, to see what happened there. Um, so it's really interesting there, too. Um, I think the one that's going to, you know, and I think this is going to be interesting to see here. Um, the regulations with the athletic-related transfer link rule. Um stays an athletes ineligible in all sports participating in the current or previous school year if that student has transferred to the school where a coach is employed who previously was a school employee at a third party con or third party contractor at the athlete's former school. So this basically means this is like a changeover. Um so basically means it, it just tells you that the athlete would be ineligible for all sports um if the um you know if the student transferred to the school where the coach who was previously employed at one school at another school. So basically it's like a follow-up, you know, sort of like that. So that means a player, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and I think, you know, I look at Caleb Williams, you know what I mean? Perfect example of this Caleb Williams. And like when he transferred out of Oklahoma to play at USC, he was immediately real eligible. Now in this case here, if, if he was still in high school in Michigan, he would not be able to play for the full year. So, you know, so I think that's really, that's an interesting, um, it, it, it's inter it makes a lot of sense. I mean, like, you know, it's sort of like, you know what I mean? They would view it as an athletic motivated thing, but it'll be very interesting to see how this rule takes place. I mean, like when it comes to the transfer rule, um, they also approved um, a change to the football practice competition rule that states that schools may not take part in intergalactic scrimmages with another school until the Wednesday at the second week of practice. Um, only if the team has conducted a football practice with at least seven separate previous days. Joint practice with another school is considered a scrimmage. It may not take place until those with seven days of practice have been completed. So basically what they're saying is you got to have seven full days of practice. 
before you um, compete with another school, which would be deemed a scrimmage. Um, that's what happened. I remember a couple, I mean, last season, of course, what happened with Oak Park. Um, so, in other schools around the, uh, in other schools, what happened? Um, so, you know, so that's really, you know, that's really where this rule comes into play when it looked like the, um, the, um, you know, when they approved, when they um, approved that rule. Um, this one's interesting. The officials rule, I call it, is the council bolstered the penalty on inappropriate behavior toward game officials. They approved an official review rec review committee recommendation modifying the penalty for any coach and athlete or athlete who is ejected for spitting, at hitting, slapping, kicking, or pushing, or intentionally and or aggressively physically contacting game official any time during that competition after being ejected. The officiating coach or athlete shall be suspended from competition for the next 14 calendar days and must complete an online sportsmanship course. The offending coach will also not be eligible to coach in the MHA tournament in that sport during that season, nor be allowed to be present at the site within sight or sound of communication of the tournament event for that team. So basically, basically, you know, what I'm saying here is this is where good sportsmanship are always winners. You know what I mean? This is where they use sportsmanship. And I, I get officials have taken a lot of, a lot of like, um, you know, they've taken, a, they've taken, they've, they've been through a lot. And, you know, and I think, you know, and obviously, you know, don't be surprised. I mean, like, I'm not, I mean, like, I'm, I mean, like, and I'm, you know, I see it a lot from, other parents, other coaches, players, heck, even myself. I mean, I'll admit that. You know what I mean? You know, I mean, like, and even my brother at times. You know, I, I mean, I admit that. You know what I mean? Like, you know, there were times that, you know, some of the officials' calls were very questionable. Um, You know, I get it. You know what I mean? I get it. I mean, but still, I mean, like, um, you know, and I think to me, you know what I mean? I get, I get where this is coming from. But, you know, when I look at, you know, and I think this is the right, I think this is the right call. Um, I mean, like, you know, for, um, you know, and I get it. Players, coaches, referees, everybody's human. I mean, everybody's human. They're, I mean, it, it's, it's emotional. You know, the game is emotional. Um, you know, I think it's kind of a little bit harsh, but had to be done. So... You know, so it'll be interesting to see how that rule goes into play here. Um, so it'll be very interesting, especially if, like, the offending coach or athlete, they'll be suspended from competition for the next two weeks. So that's, that's you know, and I think that's that's interesting, you know what I mean, to really, you know, to see, um, you know, the emotions. And I, I get it, you know what I mean? I get it, you know, I get it. So... Those are some of the big time rules. Um, obviously, um, other sports that were changed. Obviously, um, you know they. Um, I mean, there are some other ones here. Um, I'm just going through them right now. I mean, like, a, um, the running clock in soccer during the first half of it's eight nothing. Um, I wasn't surprised that was approved. Um, the golf site selection committee for golf to review the regional tournament groupings to determine where the host school and the courses. That that's interesting. Um, track and field um, recommendation for athletes to qual to for athletes to qualify for MHA finals by reaching the predetermined standards during the window beginning April first of next season and extending until the athletes regional meet. That's interesting. Um, so. I, there's some a lot of things that are really interesting here. Um, they reviewed the membership um, reports of membership 754 senior high schools, 774 junior high schools, middle schools. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to see how um, these rules, these changes are. I mean, like obviously some of the big ones, um, you know. And I think this is gonna be interesting to see um, how these rules apply to. Um, the differences and I think this and I think the big ones obviously as we talked about earlier the um volleyball I mean like boys volleyball and um and um and um girls field hockey being um being being officially MHA sports 
the officiating rule. Um, you know, I think that makes sense as well. Um, the MPR when it comes to to um soccer and um basketball districts, um, you know, that's going to be. I mean, like seating everybody. That makes sense. Um, couple things that were left out. Obviously, I know, I know the basketball coaches association beat cam has been wanting um shot clocks. Um, I've seen shot clocks in the um in high school in um high school showcase games, classics, and you know, and I think that that's interesting, but it's also very stressful on a timekeeper. So that's very interesting, but you know, but it'll be in- and then of course the change to the seasons, obviously. Boys, ba- boys basketball going more, um, I mean, starting more later, you know what I mean, and ending earlier. So, and basketball is the longest season of winter sports. So, you know, so it'd be very interesting. They kept the games at 22. Um, then they guaranteed a postseason burst. Um, so, it'll be interesting to see how these rules um, get applied. I mean, like, you know, and I think this is going to be interesting to see how, um, you know, things will go um, as we head into the um, head in the season, heading into next fall. So, but the um, volleyball, but the um, but I um, mean, actually, the MHA winter calendar will take effect in 2025, 2026. So we got two years before these new rules take effect. So it'll be very interesting to see how the rules are going to be applied. Um, and I know the basketball NPR rules, they're going to start next year. So that's going to be something to really, really watch is can the, um, is can the, you know, and I think it's going to come down to is, you know, when these rules get applied, you know, it's going to take a little while for people to adjust to them. You know what I mean? So it will be really interesting to see how people adjust to these rules. And I think that'll be something to really, really watch for. So. We'll see what happens. I mean, we will see what happens. Um, you know, obviously, you know what I mean. So we'll see what happens. I mean, I mean, I'm a little, I'm being a little specific here with the um changes, and I think this is going to be interesting to see. But the big part of the rule of the of the meeting from the representative council was the um as I mentioned earlier, the changes in um with volleyball and field hockey being sports, basketball and PR. Um, also the basketball season being um. Starting a little later, um, a little bit quicker, but, you know, but at the end of the day here, you know what I mean? It's going to be interesting to see how, um, how these rules are going to be. So we'll see what happens going forward there. Okay. Now let's go from, you know, from the MHA representative council to girls basketball, um, Oxford, they have the new girls basketball coach. William Jones is their new head coach. Places Rachel Breyer. Um, Briar, of course, stepped down from Oxford for family reasons. Um, you know, when I talked to him, Oxford Athletic Director Tony DeMere, um, he said there were three, it was down to three candidates, and Jones was one of them. Um, so Jones, we know when you look at what he's done, um, you know, a lot of people, he's been around the area, he's been around colleges, he was at Oakland Community College, um, He's also um he used to be at um he used to co- he used to be at Trenton for four years um posted a 67 21 record in his four years with the Trojans um he's been around the entire state I mean he's led he's led teams to deep postseason runs um when I look at this hire at first and I think and I'm 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 just curious and skeptical about this hire for a couple reasons. The reason why I'm curious and skeptical is because Jones is a true outsider. He hasn't, you know what I mean? You know, you look at what Oxford's been through in the past. I mean, you know, what they've been through. And this is not a rebuild over at Oxford. This is not a rebuild. And when you look at and I look at the press release statement that Oxford stayed. He said they were thrilled to have the experience, knowledge, preparation, positivity he'll bring into the program now and in the future. Congratulations, Coach Jones. So, here's my take on it. I'm curious because there's several reasons. As I mentioned, he's an outsider. Um, 
he's basically taking over a program that's been successful in the past. And you look at what Breyer's done over there at Oxford. She's done a really nice job with that program in seven years. You know, taking over that program for Coach Steve Ember. So when you look at Oxford, and they had they were 10 and 11 last year. 10 and 11. Lost to Grand Blake in the district final. You have a lot of proven talent coming back. You have Allison Huffstead. You have Sophia Robb. Mia Champing. Emma Bugs. Claire Bruski. Tegan O'Connor. Brittany Cardona. Cameron Quiddup. Caitlin Brockway. And Jalen Jacobson all coming back. So there's experience on this team. They played in the run. I am curious to see what Jones does. Oxford is normally a gritty, physical, defensive team. Offensively, they've had moments of greatness, but they've also had moments where they struggle. When I look at Jones, obviously, I know what he brings to the party. I know what he brings. He's a guy that likes to go up and down. I mean, he will make plays. He'll set plays. I mean, people are going to say, well, okay, what's Jones going to bring to this program? When you look at program strength, it's a concern over there at Oxford. I mean, it's interesting to see. I'm very curious to see what a sub varsity team is going to look like. You know, is he going to retain some of the coaches? I mean, you look at Trevor Marshall and Austin Brantley. Both of them have been proven coaches in the sub varsity level. So, is he going to make changes? That's the question I have. And then how are the players going to respond to Jones? That's the question I have. <laughs> and when I look at the situation, you know, this has got, this is going to be interesting to see. There's pros and cons with this hire. And you look at the division, Ox I'm going to start with the cons first. But when you look at Jones, I mean, like, he's walking in. It's a new setting for him. New, it's, I mean, like, he's coached girls basketball before. But it's a new, it's an unfamiliar place for him. I mean, he's had success at Trenton. He's had success at OCC. So this is really interesting to see what he brings to the table. And the other one here is how will he get along with the players that he has on this roster? This team doesn't need a full rebuild. They don't. But they went with that direction. I mean, I'm curious. They got some questions. Don't get me wrong. They got questions. I mean, you got Allison Hufstetter, who's a proven player. You guys will be a Rob, proven point guard. Mia Champagne is a proven player. I mean, you look at Tegan O'Connor. Not big, but she's physical. She can battle for the rebound inside. There is pieces on this team. There is pieces on this team. So, there, so I'm curious to see how Jones puts these pieces together. The other question I have. And I think it's going to come to June. There's two more questions I have when it comes to June. Is what's their district going to be? What is their district going to be? Because the last three years, Oxford's been to Grand Blank. They've been in a district with Grand Blank, Davison, and Lapeer. And it hasn't gone well for them. They ran into Grand Blank, lost three years. Three straight years, lost to Grand Blank. So when I look at, you know, so the district's a big question mark for me. Because there's a possibility that they could go north, they could go back north, which they've been up there the last three years. And then there's a possibility, there could be a possibility they go south toward Lake Orion. And we know when you look at Lake Orion, we know, we know they're going to be solid this year. We know they're going to be very good this year. They got some players coming back. Um, but I'm going to talk like Ori in a minute here when it comes to them, 
when it comes to the league segment because Lake Orion's in that division. But there's a possibility they could send Oxford south. Or another possibility, they could send them east. They did it for the volleyball project. They did it for volleyball. They sent Oxford in a district with Lapeer, Romeo, Port Huron, and Port Huron Northern. They could do it. They could very well do it. So that's another question. So Jones is going to have his hands full. But this is where I think Jones is going to really have his hands full. Look at the district. Look at the division you're in. The red. It is one of the most brutal divisions in the state of Michigan. When you look at the division that you're in, you got the defending Division I state champions in West Bloomfield. Yes, they lose the Davis sisters. Yes, they lost Desi Washington. But you still have Sharon and Beale coming back. You still have the Gamble Jones sisters on that, on that roster. I mean, yeah, they also lost Kendall Hendricks as well. But anytime you return Sheridan Beal and the Gamble Jones sisters, Dylan McAllister's got something there. He's got something over there. I mean, West Bloomfield's going to be fine. Then there's Clarkston. Clarkston returns probably the bulk of their team is back. Led, of course, by Eliana Roback. And Brooklyn Colbert's really can't come off the scene last year. She had a breakout campaign. And you look at that, JV, and you look at their, and their program strength at Clarkson, they're not bad. Coach Aaron Goodnow has got something going over there. Then you look at Stony Creek. Stony Creek made the state quarterfinals in Coach Columbus Williams' first year. Now, I'm curious to see how this team's going to do without Sarah LaPrairie. They do return to the Avash sisters. You have Merrick Schlaubach coming back. So when I look at Stony Creek, the question's going to be is how are they going to replace the production of LaPrairie? That's the question for Stony Creek. That's the big question for Coach Columbus Williams. This is going to be his test. This will be his test. And then there's Lake Orion. When you look at where the Dragons got back, Lake Orion was a very young team last season. You look at Izzy Walensky coming back. You look at the emerging sophomores on this team, Riley House. You look at you look at Danny Heck. You look at Nevaeh Wood in the in the post. Um, you know, and I, and obviously you look at um. And you look at what Coach Bob Bridges has done with that program. You get Lake Orion. Lake Orion's going to be, a, they're going to be scary. They're going to be scary. And a lot of that starts and ends with Izzy Walensky. Now, yes, Oxford's got talent. Oxford's got proven talent on this team. But the question I have with Oxford is going to be, is how can Jones and the players that transition period, that is the question for Oxford. Because it has to happen during the season. It cannot happen during the preseason, the summer ball. You know, it has to happen during the season. And I've looked at Oxford's schedule this year. It is brutal. It is brutal. So they're going to have to hit the ground running when I look at the Wildcats. They're going to have to hit the ground running. So when I look at Oxford, you know, having to play against teams like Birmingham Marion, um, you know, and I think when you look at what Jones brings to Oxford, the record at Trenton, he was 67-21 and 21 in his four years there. That says a lot when you look at winning percentage. When you look at the wins he's had in four years there. I mean, he's led that team, you know, to have deep postseason runs. They have proven players. He's a very experienced coach. He's been through the ranks. He's been through the AAU circuit. He's been through the, through the high school ranks. He's been through the college ranks. But there's just so many questions I have here with Jones 
at Oxford. There's so many questions. I, that's why I wrote in the column, curious and skeptical about this hire. Because the question for me is, with Oxford, program strength's a big question mark for them. When I look at, when I look at the transition period, that's a big question mark for me. Is can you can they can the girls at Oxford adjust to Jones's system real quick? Because it's a totally different system from Coach Rachel Breyer's system. It is a different system. And the question is, will he be will he retain will he retain some of Breyer some of some of Coach Breyer's staff? That's the question. I mean, there is so many questions that I have about this hire, you know, that I think, you know, it has to be answered, and it has to be answered during the season. It can't be answered right now during the summer. It can't be answered. I'd be shocked if it's answered during the summer because I don't think it has to, I don't think it's going to be answered during the summer. It's going to take, it's going to take the summer, the fall, and then during the season. Because they got to go through that transition period. It has to happen during the year. It can't happen during, you know, it's got to happen during the regular season. It's got to happen. I've got a lot of concerns with this hire. I got a lot of concerns. I know Jones has been through the red. I mean, Jones, no, sorry, Jones has been through um playing in the MAC. I mean, I mean, I got to look at the league trends and I think they're in down river. So I apologize to those in the Mac, but he's been, he's been through, I know he's had, he's, he's been very successful, very successful. And I think a lot of girls are going to look at that um, successful record. They're going to look at it, you know, and say, okay, you know, he knows how to win games. He knows how, but when you're in a league, when you're in a division that features quality coaches, when you look at Daryl McAllister, Aaron Goodnow, Bob Bridges, and um, and Columbus Williams in his first year taking over at Stony Creek, that's not going to be easy for Oxford. That's not going to be easy for them. I mean, and, and, I, and I forgot to mention Ferndale, who's coming in the league. Ferndale's in this division. And Ferndale, and you look at what Ferndale's got coming back. They got three all state all league players. Plus, I've been hearing a lot about this freshman class over there. So that's another challenge for for Coach um for Coach um Jones. That's going to be another challenge. So when I look at the challenges Oxford has. This is going to be really difficult for them because now you bring in those teams. Now you add Ferndale into the mix. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be really, really difficult. So I'm going to be curious, but I'm also skeptical. That's why I wrote in the column, you know. This has been a successful program last several years. The question I have for Oxford going forward is can this team, can the players adjust to the coaching style that Jones brings? Can he adjust to the players? Can the players adjust to him? That's the question I have. And then how will this team do in the red? When you look at the teams that are in this division, it is brutal. It is going to be brutal. Now, what helps Oxford is they have a, a they have a proven team coming back. You look at players like Sylvia Rob, Allison Huffstetler, uh, Mia Champagne, Emma Bugs, Keegan O'Connor, Claire Buskey, Brittany Cardona, Cameron Quirt, Caitlin Brockway, and, J and Jalen Jacobson. So experience that'll help. That'll help. But the question is going to be for me is, can this team, can he build on program strength? Can he gel with the players? Can the players adjust to him? 
can they all get on the same page? Now, we don't know what's going to happen in June when the districts come out. We don't know what's going to happen. But if, if this team gets on the same page, they could be in line for a nice year. They could be in line for a good year. But if not, then, then, this, then Oxford's in trouble. So there's some challenges here for Coach Jones um, going forward. And obviously, it'll be interesting to see how he does um, in a program that really doesn't need a complete rebuild. It really doesn't need it. But we'll see. And especially with this program has been through a lot. Um, it'll be interesting to see what direction Oxford goes um, with, um, with Jones taking over as the new coach. And I think it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, like I said in the blog, in the blog post I wrote or, um, a couple of days ago, I'm curious, but very skeptical. So we'll see. There's just so many questions that I have with this hire. There's just so many questions. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Okay, now we're going to go from, um, we're going to preview the um, track regionals. They're coming up this weekend here. Um, obviously, in the basketball front, we're keeping an eye on the situations over at Troy Athens um, for the boys. Also, see home for the boys. Um, girls basketball, Bloomfield Hills and Groves. Um, keeping an eye on that, on both their um, coaching vacancies um, for those schools as well. So once we get something, we'll, um, we'll um, send a report. We'll um, do a column on it. Um, and also, I'll make a report on the podcast about it. Um, so we'll see what happens, um, you know, going forward there when it comes to basketball searches. Um, now on the track and field, um, regionals start this week. So when I look at the regionals and for track and field, it's going to be interesting to see how this goes. And there's a lot of storylines here. And I think there's some, there's going to be some keys here to figure out. I mean, like. You know, heading into the regionals, starting up on Friday and Saturday. Um, so we're going to start off with where Pontiac's at. Region 19 at North Branch. you got North Branch, Pontiac, Northern Prep, Armada, Crossville X, Cranbrook, Kingswood, Goodrich, Emily City, Macomb, Luther, North, Marine City, Marysville, North Branch, Orchard Lake, St. Mary's, Brandon, Richmond, St. Clair, and Yale, and Birmingham, Marion Girls. On the girls' side here for this region, this could get tight between North Branch, Goodrich, and Yale. Um, all three teams had distance. Yale has the field events. North Branch is following the sprints. I think Relays could decide this regional. Um, if I had to pick somebody, I had to get an edge here, I'd have to say Goodrich. Um, I think Goodrich, they'll have just enough when it comes to sprints. Um, I think Goodrich gets away with this regional here on the girls' side. Now, it wouldn't surprise me if North Branch or Yale wins it. On Pontiac's case, um, they could score some points, but we'll see. We'll see. On the boys' side, you got between Northern Prep, Orchard Lake, St. Mary's, and Marine City. Yale could steal some points as well, but I just think when I look at us here from a track perspective here, I got to give an edge to Orchard Lake, St. Mary's. Um, the Eaglets have had a nice year in the Catholic League. Um, they play in one of the most premier conferences in the entire state with the Catholic League. So, it'll be interesting to see how um, this goes. And I think it'll be very interesting to see how um, if this regional is going to go. But I think I think the boys' side could be a really tight meet, especially when you look at Notre Dame Prep and Marine City. Um, both those teams are very solid teams. Um, so... But I, I just think Orchard Lake St. Mary's right now, if I, had, if I had to take a team I could trust right now in this regional, I would have to say Orchard Lake St. Mary's um, wins this regional over um, Northern Prep and also um, Marine City. Now, Marine City, I think, is going to make a meat out of it. I think they're going to make a meat out of it. But I just think at the end of the day, I just got to give the edge to Eaglets here. And I think the Eaglets will be a team to really do some damage um, in this um, in this um in this format. So we'll see what happens with Orchard Lake St. Mary's. And I think, you know, I, I think if I had to pick, if I had to pick a team to win this regional, I would have to go with the Eaglets over at North Branch this weekend. 
Um, District Region 18, this will be at Ferndale. You got 308 teams are in here. You got Ferndale, Ferndale University, Harper Woods, and then Centerline, Detroit Denby Tech, Birmingham Detroit Country Day, East English Village Prep, Detroit Henry Ford, Detroit Southeastern, East Point, Harper Woods Chandler Park Academy, Hazel Park, St. Clair Shore, South Lake, Massachusetts Lampier, Warren Fitzgerald, and Warren Lincoln. Um, on the girls' side, this could be tight between Birmingham Detroit Country Day and Ferndale. Ferndale has the edge in the sprints, whereas Detroit Country Day has the edge in the distance. Relays, I would have to give the edge to Ferndale, um, but I think it's going to come down to relays. Field events, I think it's going to come down to field events between those two teams. If I have to trust somebody in the regional and field events between these two teams right now, I would have to take Birmingham and Detroit Country Day because of the experience they have. And, you know, obviously we know the history of Birmingham and Detroit Country Day. We know what they like to do. Ferndale's done a really nice job this year. Um, their coach, athletic director, cross-country coach, track coach, Juan Rickman's done a really nice job building this program. And I think with them, it's going to come down to is can, you know, can the sprints do just enough? And can they get points in the relays? If they can get points, particularly in the distance relays, um, the 4x4, four 4x8, four, four um, those are going to be critical for Coach Rickman to get points there. Um, but also field events, can they get points in the throws? Can they get points in the, um, you know, in the jumps? Can they get points in pole vault? I mean, like, there's so many questions there for Coach Rickman. You know, they got to get points there. If they don't, they're in trouble. And I think that's really where the key is for Ferndale is can they get points um, in those areas? Because if not, Detroit Country Day is going to win this regional. So that's going to be a challenge for Coach Rickman is can they get points in that in the, um, in the distance? Can they get points in the field events? That's the big challenge for them heading in this regional. On the boys' side... I really don't see anybody touching Birmingham Detroit Country Day. Um, Harper Woods and Ferndale might have a might have might have a chance, but neither team don't have the depth to match up with them. So that'll be interesting to see how that will go. I mean, <laughs> obviously it'll be interesting to see how this one goes. So I gotta give an edge to um, I gotta give an edge here to um, Birmingham Detroit Country Day. Um, I really think the Yellow Jackets, they could be in line to do some real damage um, in this regional over at Ferndale. But Ferndale and Harper Woods will have some saves. And I think I saw Harper Woods' his, his field, field events, especially in the throws. They've been really good all year long. I mean, like, they could get points in the throws. That could be, that could decide a mean. I mean, you look at a team like Wall Lake Central a couple years, I mean, last season, uh, just basically used the power of their throws to um, get them to the, um, regional title last season, the boys. So it'll be interesting to see how this one goes. Um, but when I look at on the boys side, I've got to go with um, Berman and Detroit Country Day and both boys and also on the girls. So apologies to Coach Juan Rickman. I just don't know if I see Ferndale knocking off Berman and Detroit Country Day. So that'll be interesting to see how that one goes. Region 10, this will be at Romeo. Um, Troy Athens is in here. I mean, they're, it's basically an all Macomb County heavy district. When you look at Romeo, Chippewa Valley, Frazier, Macomb, Lance Cruz, Macomb, Dakota, Lance Cruz North, Anchor Bay, Port Huron, Port Huron Northern, Sterling Heights, Sterling Heights, Stevenson, Utica, Utica Eisenhower, and Utica 4 2. So when I look at this regional, it's a Macomb County slash St. Clair County with one Oakland County school basically in here. Um. I'm looking at this and saying to myself, okay. On the girls' side, this could get real, really, really, really interesting. Because you got Troy Athens, who's had a really nice year. They were really stout in the um, red-white meet last week at Adams. Yeah, New Baltimore Anchor Bay, who's been a distance power. Macomb, Dakota, we know they got balance. And Romeo, who's been has been who's normally solid. So when I look at this matchup here, those four schools are very capable <coughs> of getting points. 
getting points is going to be very crucial in this ma in this region. This is wide open. This regional over at Romeo on the girls' side is wide open. Anybody can win this regional, especially those four teams. Troy Athens, New Baltimore Lake Bay, Macomb, Dakota, Romeo. Whoever has the most balance in this regional is going to win this regional. So, and I think that's what it's going to come down to. Is can, is this is going to go either way. This could go one of four ways. The question for me is, if I had to pick a team right now who would be, who I, I had to be favored right now, I got it. When in doubt, I trust Macomb, Dakota. Now, people are going to say, Romeo, why, why not us? Why not Troy Athens? Troy Athens, I'm a little concerned about with them. I mean, they got balance. They got balance, but I'm a little concerned about the field events. I'm a little concerned about the distance. Got the sprints. There's a lot of questions. A lot of questions. Macomb, Dakota is a little bit more balanced. Even though I am a little concerned about the distance. New Bob Rankin Bay is really good in distance. So is Romeo, for that matter. So is Romeo. So, this is going to be interesting to see how this shapes up. This regional shapes up. Because I think this is going to be even. This is going to be tight. I think it's going to be really, really tight in that region. It'll be really tight. The boys' side of this regional, I think Chippewa Valley, New Baltimore Anchor Bay, and Romeo. Romeo's the wild card in this. This whole thing. New Baltimore Anchor Bay has the hurdles. They have someone in the pole vault. Um, and then you look at Chippewa Valley. They have sprints. New Baltimore Anchor Bay and Troy Athens both have distance and mid-distance. So, I'm looking at this regional, and I'm saying to myself, okay, Romeo's a wild card in this, but if I had to pick a team who can win this regional right now, people would say, well, Chippewa Valley's going to be the favorite in this region. Yes, but sometimes sprinting events doesn't always help. you got to have balance in these regionals. New Baltimore and Kamei, do they have the sprints? Troy Athens, do they have the sprints? Whoever has the most balance in this regional is going to win. If I had to pick somebody right now, I would have to pick New Baltimore and Bay. They have balance, but barely. But barely. Because they have the distance, they have the hurdles, and they have someone in the pole ball. So we'll see how this one goes. But it also depends. Could they not show if they show up? You know what I mean? You know, this is what stats happen. You know what I mean? This is anything can happen in this region over at Barnabas. Anything can happen over there. So it'll be very interesting to see how this one goes. Really interesting. We'll see how this one goes. Region 9 at Milford. You got... You got... Boatload of boy teams here. You got Lake Orion, Clarkson, Oxford, West Bloomfield, Farmson, North Farmson. Along with Milford, Lapeer, Nobody, Detroit, Catholic Central, Wall Lake Northern, Wall Lake Central, Wall Lake Central... Um, Wall Lake West and Waterford Kettering, Waterford Mott, Lakeland, and Farmdale's Mercy. Girl side of things, this could be interesting. I think the two best teams are West Bloomfield and Lake Ori. Reason why I say this is you look at the points. West Bloomfield had a nice was had a nice performance at the um at the um, blue gold meet. They had a nice performance. They feature one of the best sprinters in Canada. They have one of the best sprinters. Some of the best sprint relays I've seen in a long time. They're dangerous. And I know their coach very well. I know Coach Jack Hilbert really well. He does an amazing job with those girls over there. Does an amazing job with those girls. And he also does a pretty good job coaching football, too. He does a really good job coaching football, too. I'll be curious to see how... I'll be very curious to see in the, in the um, football preview show, especially when we do call it starting um, in a couple, a couple weeks here. Um, seeing how the state of the Lakers are. Especially with the football program. But I think in track, it's going to come down to is 
West Bloomfield and Lake Orion are going to be or look like they're the two teams to beat in this regional. Now, Wall Lake Central and Clarkson are going to be challenged. They're going to be the two toughest challengers. Wall Lake Northern looks to be the wild card. I think in this regional on the girls' side, this is going to be tight. This is going to be really, really tight. So we'll see how this one goes. But I think West Blue, if I had to pick an early edge right now, West Bluebeal and Lake Orion are probably the two teams that I think would scare you in this regional. I really think these are the two teams that could scare you in this regional. Um, obviously, you know how good Wall Lake Central is, especially in the throws. Um, field events are normally good. Distance are decent. Um, Wall Lake Northern looks to be the wild card. I expect the girls' side of this regional is going to be tight. I really do. Then the boys' side. This looks tight. I mean, like last season. Wall Lake Central, obviously we know they bring the throws to the mix. Um, Clarkston, they're strong in the mid-distance. No way Detroit Catholic Central and West Bloomfield are proven split powerhouses. It's going to be similar to last season. Very similar. <laughs> Whoever has enough balance will win this region. Whoever has enough balance will win this region. First double region. Last year, Wall Lake Central won the boys regional because of their balance. What they did in the throws was huge. West Bloomfield. We know he's got the sprinters. Nobody Detroit Catholic Central kind of look at, of course, okay. You got the, um, you kind of look at with them. You got the sprinters. You got, I mean, like, they're your wild card. They're your wild card. Clarkson, they got some balance. They got some balance. They've had a nice year. But they got some balance. So it'll be very interesting to see what the Wolves bring to this meet, to this regional. It'll be interesting to see. Farmington could be a sleeper. They could be. I mean, they've traditionally been really good in the um, distance. Milford's another one. Milford, we know, has been very good in the um, in the distance. We know that they've been very proven. So, and it's at home for them. It's their home track. So, it'll be very interesting to see how this regional goes over at Milford. It'll be very interesting. And then our last but not least, the regional over at Rochester. Um, you got Rochester, Adams, Stony Creek, Avondale, Groves, Berkeley, Seaholm, Olympia Hills, Oak Park, Royal Oak, South Anderson Tech, Troy, Birmingham Brother Rice, U Detroit University, Detroit Jesuit, Detroit Mumford, in the girls' side, and Detroit Renaissance. On the girls' side... This is going to be interesting. Oak Park, Rochester, Detroit Renaissance could be a sleeper. Detroit Renaissance, we know, is traditionally good in the sprints. So is Oak Park, for that matter. So is Oak Park. Rochester has got balance. They got some balance. They got distance. You look at a player like Lucy Cook over there. You got Mendoza leading him in the throws. I mean, Rochester is a juggernaut. They are a juggernaut. Oak Park, sprints, relays. They got just enough mid-distance. Hurdles has been good for them. There's a reason why they're defending Division I state champions. And they're going to rely a lot on, on those events. I seriously think Rochester could challenge them. I seriously think Rochester could challenge him. This basically because of the balance. Seahawks a sleeper in the distance. <laughs> Royal Oak is a sleeper in the throws. We know how good Royal Oak is. They're not bad. They're not bad. Seahawks, we know what they've done in the distance. They've always been a traditional distance power. So that's going to be interesting to see how this one goes. And then you look at, on the other side of things, you look at then Oak Park. Sprints. Hurdles. Relays. Detroit Renaissance. Same thing. 
What if those two teams cancel out? Opens the door. It opens the door, seriously. It really opens the door. So, if I'm Oak Park, if I'm Detroit Renaissance, I better be very, very careful of the home team. Really do. Be very careful, because I think Rochester arguably has got the best distance team in that regional. They got the best distance team in that regional. And I think they got the best distance athlete over there in Lucy Cook. Lucy Cook could have a field day in this region. Home track, you know, she's been in the States. She was in the state last year. Had a great experience last year. I think she was part of that 4x8 team that went to the, um, that went to the state final. She's a proven state champion. So, this is going to be interesting to see how this one goes. Over there on the girls' side. Then on the boys' side. How do I explain this? This could be tight. Last year, Adams won the regional. And it wasn't close. They had a knockoff UD Jesuit. I apologize for that. They had a knockoff UD Jesuit. It was in, it was at Detroit Renaissance. Now, Oak Park, UD Jesuit, and Detroit Renaissance could be wild card teams. Troy's another team to watch. Troy took second in the in the Red White League meet last week. Behind Adams. Adams won it. They won the Red White. Adams has a thing called balance. Coach Eric Lohr is a great coach. He's a very good coach when he has balance. He's got balance this year. Sprints he's got. He's got hurdles. He's got distance. He's got field events. Very proven at this. Very proven. And for Adams, they're close to home. They don't have to travel far for the regional. That's one of the reasons why I have I have Adam's favor here. Oak Park, you know, I'm, I got questions with them, especially when it comes to distance and field events. Always had questions with them. UD Jesuit, they got sprints. They got field events. Distance is a big question mark for me. Detroit Renaissance, same question. Distance is a big question for the Phoenix. Troy? Could make some noise. Royal Oak could make some noise. Groves is another team to watch out for, especially in the throws. Groves is a very good throwing team. Really good. They have one of the best throwing programs this season. So that's something to really watch for. If you're... I mean, Groves... They, I mean, the throws could win you a meet, especially in a meet like this. I mean, you look at other individuals. You look at Stony Creek, Spencer Beekman. I'm really high on this kid. What he's done in the throws this year. He won the league meet last week. He's an incredible athlete. He's only a junior. I can only imagine what Coach Rick Powell's going to be like when he sees him. He's going to be excited. And I know he plays football. So, I think he's going to be the favorite in the throws. But it'd be interesting to see how this goes. As a team, I got to give the edge to Adams. I have to give the edge to Adams. Several reasons. I think the Highlanders are a team that can make some noise. They're going to make some noise like they did last year. Now, it's a different team than they were last year. But they won the red. Won the league meet. I think they're going to make some noise in this region. And I think it's going to come down to, but it's going to be a tight one. Like it always has been. So we'll see what happens. See what happens. 
All right, before I go here, obviously, we're as I mentioned, we're going to keep an eye on the basketball coaching situations. As I mentioned earlier when we talked Oxford, um, Oxford girls, so it'll be something to really watch for um, coming up, especially with the summer with summer league starting up pretty soon. You know, as we get closer into the end of the school year and summer leagues start going and everything starts, um, you know, everything starts um, going. So we'll see what happens. Remember to sign off here. Make sure you follow the blog at saginaway 4650 at blogspot.com for the latest around the OA. So we'll see what happens going forward.